here is just to get a quick look at uh, some wallaby grasses, no matting on the ground. Um, to look at this patch of kangaroo grass that you saw that was established in 2000 uh, at, the, at the, the first seminar in June. Um, to look at what a younger kangaroo grass plant, not part of the original, can look like. This is probably about, this one's about two years old. Um, there's that tone, that colour tone that I was wanting you to keep your eye out for. It's a little bit different when we turn around in a sec and look at the windmill grass behind us. Well, there's a couple of patches yeah, yeah. of windmill grass just here. Windmill, straight in front. And yeah, kind of, the, the coloration is, is similar, only this has got a lot more green in it. The reason I gave you that sheet is I want you to drop your focus to that spot. This, this is taken out of Fred Turner's book. Now, Fred, Fred Turner was the, uh, one of the classic botanists in, in the early part of Australia's history, you know, Australia's European history, if you like. And he, uh, I, I love the introduction to this book. He starts talking about how over the last 20 years, in clearly the 1880s, 1870s, 1880s, he's covered 40,000 miles. And now he's looked at native, native pastures. Now, you think 40,000 miles, not too bad but that's 40,000 miles on foot and by horse. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot of distance travelled. So he's, he's actually been all around the place. He, you'll see the names changed. And that Anthesteria, Anthesteria, uh, you know, it's, that's what it was called. But it's been, the, it's been uh, changed now a couple of times now, so that it's, you know, it went through Themata Australis, now it's Themata Triandra. So just to change things, change, make things light, difficult for everyone else. So, but, uh, Fred Turner's just a, just a legend within this whole game. And you've got quotes of that in your handout from the, from the previous thing on, on, on what his recommendations for, for kangaroo grass and horses was. Um, on, on your sheet, rather than, rather than looking at this particular clump, look at, the, look at the seed stalk and count the spikelet clusters. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven spikelet clusters. There's a fertile floret for each of those clusters. When I grab a windmill grass seed head with its eight prongs on it and run my fingers along one of those prongs, I get 90. Run my finger along, thanks Ian. One of those prongs, I get 90 seeds. So if I do it, one of your, your wallaby grass seed heads, flick it a few times, get the, a handful out, you'll have 60 florets. So this, that is the problem, or one of the problems with this grass. It just doesn't produce heaps of seed. It produces massive root system that this plant probably won't have reached a metre and a half yet, but it'll be on its way. Um, so those things are, are something you have to keep in mind uh, and as many people will say and, uh, and Ian will reinforce this is this is this is a, this can be a really tricky grass but it's one of the most important grasses for us uh, so so we kind of have to get it right as a seed producer if if this grass wasn't so so widely desired and so emblematic of Australia I wouldn't bother with it it's just horrible it doesn't produce much seed. It's hard to establish in, in some ways. It's got you know, a lot of trickiness, has a lot of dormancy in the seed. So, you know, you get a bag of seed, you might, might not all be germinable. And it might only be 5% that's germinable at that date. And then, and then the, the rest of it becomes germinable over the next little while. It's, it's a tricky grass, but it's a great grass. So when you've got it, it'll actually persist. Now, Pauline's got a, a lovely stand of it at her place. You've got it, she's got that forever unless you do something really bad to get rid of it. No. <laughs> this is old. Uh, and the reason this has is, this is started to look fairly shocking is because the last couple of years have been difficult for two reasons. One, for, for me personally in activity, um, but second, the weather. And the winters have been so warm that this grass has produced 
seed all the way through winter. That means I can't go through and spray, over spray, like I've done this time. I can't burn to get rid of all this thatch because I've got a, a growing plant and I, a, there's a danger of killing it. Uh, so this has gone backwards. Hard to know what I'll do with it. Ian would say, plough part of it in and reseed it or something like that. No, no, he wouldn't say that. I shouldn't put words in his mouth. Um, uh, but what we're going to do is continue this whole section down here with, with, uh, with Andrew's grassy ground cover restoration project, big mix of multiple um, species of plants. So it's going, we won't see this until 2017, so it'll be kept nuked until that time. And you can see what happens. The moment you've got no cover, that just oozes water because there's nothing to you lose the water and the structure of the soil starts to not get too good, which is why you can't nuke for a long time on, on sloping ground. Anyway, next thing we need to do is turn around and look at the, the windmill grass. So this looks dead, but it isn't. It's only looked dead recently when the frosts have been so horrendous. I didn't plant this. A few plants appeared on that side of the track and in no time at all, this was here. And all I do is spray the broadleaf weeds out, and I missed a few here, and, and go through. And I can do it now, because I can't kill it. There's just not enough green material in there for me to kill that windmill grass. So I can overspray this with any broadleaf herbicide and also with, um, with glyphosate. So if you come back in a week or two, and we've had a couple of good days, uh, there'll be all these brown patches through it. Well, what? Oh should say one thing, and it, and it can be irrigated. So Morris Collins that we had breakfast with this morning, big sheep farmer over the hill, that's his lamb fattening paddock on the Tunkillo Road. He irrigates it because he's got a, a license. And so over summer, he irrigates his chlorus. It's the dominant grass, there's not much else in it. And, and as a result, um, He's got feed right through until uh, the lamb sales. And he did a story for us for the Native Grass Resources Group. So that story's recorded. Yeah. We'll move through yeah, here. Before you go, before you go, this, yep. this grass is actually really useful as a pioneer species. Yep. So if you're talking about an area that you might have had, had damage done or you know, it, it might have been, uh, you know, you, you've had some earthworks, you, you, you've had uh, something else go on, Chloris is a really good one to quickly establish and cover the ground. It really is great for that sort of purpose. So you can either water yeah. it or the conditions are right yeah. when you plant it and you'll have it emerged within three days. Yeah, and, and really in terms of value for money, this is really good. You don't need much seed and it doesn't cost a hell of a lot. You get a lot of seed per kilo. So this is windmill grass. What's windmill the fodder value? Oh, moderate. I wouldn't say it's great. But it, you know, it's, it, it'll give you green, green fodder when everything else is dry and dead. I'd and, rather have that. And it'll give you cover, what David was talking about. Mm. Yes, yeah. yep. Yep. Um, so as we walk down here, you just do the same thing as we did over on the paddock. Have a look at things that look um, warm season. So as you're walking through here, you're walking through cotton grass that you saw mentioned over there, and you're walking through uh, red grass, and you're walking through windmill grass. What's this one here with the curly? That's one? cotton grass. Mm. And that's uh, um, vulpia or something like that. It's an exotic. Okay. We'll keep walking because uh, Kim's watching her watch, and I well appreciate that it's not looking too good. So we'll walk in from this end. All of this over here is common wheat grass. So it'll give you a good idea of the way the, the, the leaves form with common wheat grass. So that's this section over here. As we move through here, this is a wallaby grass. One, one or two species. And pretty clean. It's, I'm pretty pleased with it. Keep coming. And, and over there is another wallaby grass. I think Cetacea 
uh, lower tussock, smaller tussock. And those two nasty things there are Pentachistus, got a new name now, but South African, and they can take over your property. So you saw Ian's griffin, so you know what microlina looks like. Well, guess what? This is microlina too. This is a different form of microlina. See, way bigger leaf. Way, big, way bigger much, leaf and much yeah. broader, bigger yep. plant. And and not not seemingly affected by frost. Whereas you look at this lot of weeping rice grass and it's got a bit of burn to it. It's also got uh, kangaroos grazing it, but it's got a bit of burn to it. Over there, where the pink flags are, is a different form again of weeping rice grass, bigger tussocks. The last two things here of significance, this is a wallaby grass white top, Cispatosa, quite leafy, tends to get to a big plant. You can see the remains of it on the edge, the wire edge there. Just here is another stand of a different wallaby grass. And this one is full, its, it's species name is Fulva. Fairly big tussock, good leaf growth. So there's a lot of potential in the wallaby grasses for, for us growing decent pastures because the wallaby grasses are particularly good almost all year round provided they don't get a severe winter, uh, summer. And as we do a turn to head out towards the bus, um, the little things that look dead in here are lemon scented grass, the same family as Symbopogon citrinus that comes from Asia and this is Symbopogon ambiguous. Um, Big tussock gets up about so high, seed heads up here somewhere and has the most beautiful aroma. Red grass does too. Red grass has a lovely sweet aroma when it's cut. Um, so we might think of, remember the story that those of you were at where I read you the story about the haymakers of Romania? We may end up going down a path like that, down the track, where, where we actually start to put aroma into the hay and see how that works. Yes? Um, I'd like to get a group standing around my tree. Uh, yeah. Microlina. Actually, that, the microlina works well. You have to say Lee, don't you? I don't think they can see you. <laughs> so if you all believe in history, that's an historical shot. <laughs> Thank you, Miriam.